So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming along to our workshop on aligning change management with talent management. M my name is Mandy Geel. This is my colleague Jackie Munro and our, our colleague Liz Rich is sitting at the back of the room. Um, together we set up Learning Partners as a talent management consultancy 17 years ago. Um, Liz and Jackie from an HR background and myself from a business process re-engineering background. And we're delighted today to welcome Victoria harris Clark who is the Deputy Director of Solution Support in SAP. And although as a talent management consultancy we engage usually with the HR function in any organization to, to deliver services into that client, we thought that it would be of interest to HR professionals to listen more about how you go about embedding your talent management strategy in your organization into the day-to-day -day running of a business so that it becomes part of the DNA of the organization. So we thought it would be of interest then to invite kind of the end user of talent management um, strategy and, and, and services and products to give you and share with you her insights and feedback onto the case study of how um, talent management really drove and supported the outcomes of change within her, her department. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Victoria to um, address you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So first of all, some of you might have heard of SAP, but for those of you who haven't, we are the biggest software business application company in the world. We're the third largest software company in the world behind people, brand names like Microsoft and Oracle. So we have a very large global company. I work for the UK and Ireland specifically around solution support, which was an area where the business felt that we could grow. So what do we do in solution support? Primarily, what we do is we look after SAP's biggest UK-based global companies. Our role in there is to be trusted advisors to these companies from an SAP standpoint and add value to them and reduce things like return on investment, which I'm sure you hear lots and lots about all the time. The big thing for us is the trusted, trusted partner. So it's about collaboration and partnership. Now, when I started in this department five years ago, we were a very, very small amount of people. And the director I work for is called Paul Helms. And Paul had a vision. And the vision was that actually our support should be the differentiator in buying our software which is quite a big vision. But how do we get there? Well, we need to do a number of things which are on the slides that you see. We need to grow our revenue, grow our people. We need to improve our customer experience. So these are all normal things that you see in challenges in our businesses day to day, in every business. But what made the difference for us was we knew that our people could make that difference for us. We have services. We know they're scalable, sustainable. We know that they work on a global scale. But our people were very important to make the difference in our customers. We needed to, to increase our revenue, as it says. So as I move on to the second slide, you'll see what our results were. I'm very proud to stand up here today. I'm very passionate about what we've achieved. Um, these are real figures. These are, we have made these huge growth in revenue, but also in people. And as you see, we have made a huge growth in people, but bigger growth in revenue. Now, why, why have we been able to do this? Well, we've been able to do this for a number of different reasons. We've retained staff, so we've lowered our costs. In the retention of staff, that was not only good for continuity for us internally in the team, but also good for our customers. With our customers, they're signing big support engagements that are customised. These engagements are two-year minimum contract. So continuity is very important. Customers want to know that we, as SAP, understand their business. And yes, we can use tools and platforms to have all this information, but actually, a lot of the time, it comes from consistency in the people as well. So continuity of service internally and at our customers was important. We had very low attrition. We also, when we started, nobody really knew about us. 
within SAP, let alone outside in the customers. And what we've managed to achieve in highlighting what we do is we've attracted the best people internally as well. So we're always being asked the question of when are you going to have more headcount available? When can we speak to you? Obviously, we have a nice issue of people don't leave the team, so it's not that we're backfilling people regularly. But they want to know when they can come and join our team. It's a very specialist team, and it's about keeping those specialist skills in the team. When we do recruit, we have a very um, extensive program for recruitment, which actually Learning Partners helped us put together. Because we realised that we can bring people with the technical skills to our customers, but also we needed to build a team that had the right behaviours and right values to sit with what our customers needed and also with this vision and with SAP's beliefs, behaviours as well. So when we did it, we of course needed the skill sets, but we took into account a holistic view rather than just the skill set itself. So we optimised our people to best fit their roles. How did we do this? Well, everybody has gaps in their learning and needs development. So which customers, of course, were running the right products for their skill set, but also how do their values and what they want to do, do and how they want to develop fit with the customer we're going to put them in? Will they develop in that customer? Will the customer benefit from the skills and behaviours that this individual shows? So it was multifaceted, and I, we don't always get it right. But I think in the last three years, we've only had to move one person off a contract because they weren't getting on with the customer. And when we're running a large business, that's quite something. And of course, that continuity continues as well. So as you can see, there were many things that we had to employ to, to get these results. And we'll go through many different models that we introduced and different methods and workshops that we ran in the company to make these results achievable. Of course, we've got to continue achieving these great results, and that's the issue we have now. So what I'm going to do is just to um, sort of get down to the guts of this, really. How did we do, do this? And I wanted to start by just describing very briefly our model of talent management, because there are many ways of thinking about talent management. In some cases, people perceive it as a high potential program. So what we've done is we've concentrated on what are the outcomes of talent management rather than necessarily the things that you do to achieve it. Um, but you probably notice as you look at that, there are some things that you do, for example, like having a competency framework that actually will support lots of different talent management outcomes. So we're looking for uh, creating a talented organisation with talented managers who are running teams that are talented and within those teams that the individual um, the individuals that belong to those teams are also talented and the motivated and engaged people. So we break it down into four key areas. Talent acquisition is, sort of speaks for itself. Um, talent optimization, though, is, is the idea that the, the roles that people engage in and perform and the targets and measures that are used to me measure their performance are fully aligned with the business goals and that individuals are also empowered to go about their their roles and deliver the results and also that they're held accountable. So this I think in a sense links HR much more structurally into the functions, the other business functions um, and, and, and emphasizes how you play a role in facilitating the outputs of other functions. The bottom two areas are actually probably again self-evident talent development and, and particularly talent engagement. So with that model in mind, what we're going to do is we're going to look, first of all, at looking at a change management approach and how that can be aligned with, with talent management, developing mindsets for talent engagement, looking at the role of targets in the context of roles and, and how that affects talent optimization and acquisition, and then the role of feedback in underpinning change and talent development. Now, you, you've, you've probably sort of clocked by now that that we see change management and talent management as almost one and the same thing. And it's, it's quite interesting because often I think as an HR professional, you, in your organisation there is a change initiative and it's spearheaded or, or sponsored by another part of the business. So, you know, in Victoria's case, the change came from customer services, customer support type area and motivation. So I think that 
that sometimes the question is, is that change bigger than talent management or is it smaller than? And that very much uh, addresses the, the impact and the influence that you have in, in the overall outcomes and what happens. So I think we'd encourage you to, to see that actually change management and talent management are aligned and, and in some cases change is smaller than talent management. You know, at the very least it's, it's equal to. So all the things that you're doing in a change initiative will be supported and helped by almost good housekeeping in, these, in this area as well. And when change occurs, if it isn't looked at in the context of, of what's happening on an everyday basis, people will struggle to sometimes to engage with it. So that's, that's just a food for thought at this point. Okay, Andy? Just before I hand over to Mandy, I need, need to explain that one of Mandy's roles in Learning Partners is to scan... Uh, current, past, and future research to make sure that what we're doing in, in the things that we're in, doing for our clients is actually leading edge and is, is taking advantage of research. What she then does is hand it over to, to Liz and myself, and, and we then sort of make sure that what we're doing is practical. And man, managers can get it in about five minutes, because if they don't get it in five minutes, they'll, they probably won't do it. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Um, some time ago, in fact, 2003, I spotted a piece of research that was done by McKinsey uh, as part of their quarterly review, although actually I think they ought to rename it the Every Other Day Review because they send a, a whole load of information which you have to filter through. But I really liked this piece of, of research. What it said was that they'd done some research into companies that were successful in taking people through change. And, they, and people who, companies that were successful did this at three levels. And the most basic level was at the systems and processes, how things work. So, for example, within solution support, they wanted to introduce a different engagement model and a different type of role in, in delivering support to their customers. But the second and deeper level is change in mindsets. So what people think their purpose is and how they fit into the bigger picture. For example, in um, finding people to uh, deliver the results in the new role within solution support, what kind of attitudes does this person need to have? What kind of skills do they need to have in order to be able to be motivated to actually deliver the results and engage in that role? And then at the deeper level of change, successful companies managed cultural change, which is what people actually do, how they behave. So for example, within solution support, what were the skills and behaviours required for someone to be successful in the new role that was required to deliver the business change? And what McKinsey's also said was that four conditions were required to make this change work. So, first of all, in roles, that people have role models at every level, not just leading from the top, but at all levels within an organisation, because people learn from seeing people do the things that you want them to continue doing and beliefs that people actually believed in their role and their role purpose and actually could link then their own motivation and drive to the goals that you wanted them to achieve. The third area and condition was that targets actually match the desired behaviours. So for example, if you're looking at a new role which looks at proactive customer advice, are there any targets and measures that you could actually see is someone actually doing this? And it's quite often that we see in organisations that the targets do, do not align with the desired outcomes of change. And at the fourth condition was that people had the skills, but were also able to coach others in the skills, not only of the, the new skills you wanted in your organisation, but actually through the process of change. And another piece of research I've looked at since then looks at the, the success for, for ongoing for companies into the future, suggests that if you have managers who on a day-to-day -day basis are good coaches, that they are going to keep um, sustain your, the success in your organisation. So I, handed, I looked at this research and handed it over to Liz and Jackie and said, how can we make this practical to make sure we integrate it into what we do on a day-to-day -day basis? So I'll just make this um, uh, quite quick, really. The, um, what the McKinsey research looked at, really, was essentially some rational stuff and some emotional stuff. Um, and it's quite, you know, quite interesting and, and it's quite important that both these aspects are covered. So the, the roles and targets guidance from McKinsey seem to us to fit very much in the acquisition and optimization area. And clearly roles actually and targets cover both of those. But particularly in this area we're focused on, on it in terms of ac acquiring um, people in the roles because 
solution support needed to grow quite massively in terms of its, its um, skills and, and people. So the roles and targets fit in there, and then the beliefs and skills are very much part of engagement and development, and that's very much addressing the, the mindsets and culture aspects of, of the McKinsey model. Um, and again, you know, they're interchangeable, but, but it, it spoke sort of quite particularly to those areas. So I think once again, what this demonstrates is how a change initiative is very much embedded into the, the daily activity of, of talent management. So what we did in our approach with working with SAP is we took a strategic view. Um, we didn't just concentrate on a single intervention. We were able to use the model as a guideline to say, where are, you know, where, where are we, what are we doing well here, what do we need to do differently? So we took a systematic approach, um, got feedback, and reviewed the results, which enabled us to pace the speed of change, working very closely with Paul and Victoria. So in terms of the four conditions, we helped um, define clear role and career structures. We made sure that people were aligned um, to the purpose of the change. We were able to help Victoria and Paul link targets to roles and to the business and make sure that the skills programs we engaged with with SAP were actually appropriate to the role. So this was a different type of, of um, different skills training. So the feedback I've got for this and the insights that we got, well, we did take people through a big role processing, um, role, pro role profiling process. And this was about setting the strategic direction, as Mandy said, and taking people on a, on a journey. The journey was important to take everybody with us. If you don't take the people with you on the journey when you're doing a change, when you're increasing the revenue as much as we did and expanding the team, you get um, some frustrations, confusion, and people don't move on. They don't embrace it and take it. So it's very important that we all understood where, where we were going why we were going there, what measures were involved of seeing how we were successful along that journey, and actually what those roles involved. Um, the right people need to be in the right roles, as I said, mentioned earlier. But what I haven't mentioned yet is in our team, we do a number of roles each. So that makes it even more difficult to understand, actually, if you're doing a good job, because you're swapping from one role to another. Some people can actually fulfill three roles in one week, other people might fulfill a couple of roles in a couple of weeks. And if you're, you're lucky, and you might fulfill one role in three months. But that is unsettling for people if they don't understand it, if they don't understand actually what they need to achieve in that role and what the objective of that role is and how you measure if you're successful in that role. So with this, we had to make sure that we had tools that were understandable and practical for us to use and also easy for us to use. One as a management team, but also for the main team too. We were in a great change period with a lot of people. And in our environment, um, things are critical or they're a priority. And they only get dealt with, even if they are a priority, when they become critical because we're too short a time. And because of the great amount of change in the the increased revenue, you never quite have enough people to do the work you need to do. So you have to prioritise in certain ways. Now this is a way we have prioritised. Um, we hope that that might change, that behaviour change in future. But if these tools were not easy to use, we wouldn't have used them. If we couldn't remember them, we wouldn't have used them. Because we didn't have time, to be honest. So it had to be something that we could apply very easily and was very understandable both to us and to them to make sure that we continued on this journey. The other thing is we used the feedback model that Learning Partners introduced us to. Now feedback is inherently hard to give to people. Um, and we found in our part of the organisation, a lot of the people that we've recruited are very, very technical. So the feedback they give is very, very specific, very logical um, and can come across quite aggressive at times. So how did we take that sting out of the feedback? Well, we used a model that was introduced to us by learning partners. Um, and it took us round in a model and a process. Now, for the logical people in our team, that was great because they had a process to follow. They loved it. And for us, it actually took some of that personalization out of it, you know, personal attack out of it. Yes, it's personal because it's feedback. Of course it is. But it wasn't aggressive with it. Um, the wording which we all used, we learned. So we actually knew the process and what was coming. And for, this, for us, that was massive, not only to our team, but then we started employing it at our customers. 
So rather than telling our customers, yes, they've just done a good job, um, or how well they've done, we could give them the feedback that they actually needed to improve, which so many people shy away from. But because it built the confidence in our team to do that, and it was just a process they followed, it's something that we could employ elsewhere in the business and with our customers. So for us, that was invaluable. With Learning Partners, we did have an investment up front uh, to do all these great things. We built a very strong foundation with them, and that takes investment. However, what we've found with the different models we've used is now we're trying to do things ourselves. And that's great because they've taught us to do it. So we're not going over the same ground again and again and again. But what we have also found useful was the fact that we've put checkpoints in at key milestones or on timelines. So therefore we have almost like a pulse check. Are we heading in the right direction? Are we just conning ourselves because we're marking our own homework? Um, that was important to us, along with the fact that when the leadership team had difficult decisions and they were a little bit unsure of were we making the right decision, actually did we have the right thoughts, did we have all of the opinions, we would speak to learning partners as a sounding board and for us because they understood our business but they weren't part of our business, it was invaluable and we've got many people we can go to inside SAP and have these discussions and they're invaluable to us as well but it was the objectivity that was brought in that was refreshing they would challenge what we did but there was no political slant on it so the feedback was invaluable for us to make a change and the right decision and believe in that decision that we were going to make So I'm just going to uh, quickly introduce you to um, some of the tools and, uh, that we use with Victoria, which were, were fairly easy, easy to use, as she said. Um, the first thing that we did was we, we looked at the research done by Dan Daniel Goleman in emotional intelligence and emotional intelligent leadership. And that was quite interesting because alongside that coming out and becoming popular, um, we also engaged with a professor of neuroscience to try and understand what, what neuroscience was telling us about behaviour in people. And the key thing that came out there was the fact that, particularly over the last 10 years, neuroscience has suggested that our rational processes are much more at the mercy of our emotions than perhaps many of us are comfortable with, and that they are working at the unconscious and the conscious level. So however much people might say this is a logical decision, I'm going to be objective, they are in, in a sense engaging in an emotional process. So that was very important and it was a, an important piece of research and a body of research to persuade our, you know, the technical managers in SAP and other clients that thinking about people actually wasn't you know, very hard and confusing because they'd say, well look, people just don't behave logically, so you know, they never will and I don't understand them. So they'd avoid it. So, it was really important. So the, the, the idea and concept of resonance styles which create a good state in people was very important. And the research that suggested that performance was enhanced by people who were in a constructive frame of mind and that sustained stress, anxiety and even fear would actually cause the performance to degrade was really very helpful. So the idea that, that we use resonance styles and then pace setting and, and commanding which are the dissonance styles should be used advisedly. And that was a, a, a big breakthrough, really, in terms of using research to support probably what I would say was common sense. Okay. Um, so that was the sort of emotional aspect. The other thing we did was we thought, okay, we need something that's logical, so we use the NLP DILTS model of logical levels. And this enables you to understand how an individual is constructed in terms of the impact on their behaviors and also how to align an individual with goals and targets and themselves. So, I mean, very quickly, it demonstrates that values are, in a sense, the golden part, that values drive behavior, motivation, judgment, all sorts of things. And we're able then to use that at an organizational level so that the logical levels connect the individual to the business. So, for example, if you have a, a business value, company value, you need to communicate that in the context of the individual's personal values. And you can also use this, this model and, uh, to define cultural change. The final thing was, was using Myers-Briggs, which is a very, very well established, tried and tested instrument. Um, so what we did with learning partners was we, we decided we would make Myers-Briggs accessible and logical. Because people said, well, look, it's all about loads of behaviors and, you know, do I 
am I tidy or am I punctual? And I can't really get it. It's, it's far too confusing. So we carried out some research um, to ask people of different preferences and, and in the four temperament groups, what's important to you here about having this preference? So we've got a very robust, very logical, very meaningful model of values associated with the Myers-Briggs approach, which people just understand and can work from first principles and the logic. And that was a major breakthrough in getting technical managers to understand that people are logical and that emotions are logical. So I think that was particularly helpful. Okay. So how we actually applied this within the solution support team. Um, with the leaders, so that's with Victoria and Paul, and other team leaders in the organization, as part of skills training, were able to identify which were their preferred leadership styles, um, where were the gaps. Also, what were their individual work style preferences, and then what were their values that actually motivated them to do come to work on the morning uh, and en enjoy their job um, and we help them create a personal development outcome for themselves as leaders but also for managing the team and took a similar approach with the team but through different skills uh, training so that each member of the team were also able to understand their work style preferences and values were able to help them create a team personality of how they wanted to behave and define some team shared team values. The result of that was that Paul and Victoria, as leaders of that team, were able to engage the team and accept the change. So for us as leaders, we really needed to understand ourselves. And being people in the IT industry wasn't necessarily something we had done before. So we needed to understand what our strengths were, but also where our blind spots were. I was very lucky to be in a team with the director I had that we were complete opposite ends of the Myers-Briggs curve, which actually created a lot of balance. You'd think it would cause frustration, but in this case it didn't, and it made it very, very powerful. So I was able to learn a lot from him, and still am, um, around strategy and vision, because this is not one of my great points. And he could also learn from my strengths. So actually for us as a development experience, it's been very, very beneficial. But also for the team, it's been great because we've been using a consistent language. We've been using common language. This has also helped our customers because we've got a consistent approach. We have <laughs> similar values. Our team has similar values. They also know and understand what they can expect from us, which is a big thing. And, you know, what we do do and what we don't do. That is a big learning from all of us. For the team, the skills save time because we understood each other. There's less friction in the team. Understanding each other's strengths takes me on to the next one, which, most importantly, common purpose. We all had a common purpose. We were all on that journey together. My, my boss uses the analogy of a bus. We're all on the bus and heading in the same direction. Okay, the bus might go on different journeys, but we're all on that bus together. And if you're not in the right seat, that's fine. We can change your seats because you might not be in the right role, but you must be on that bus. You must have a common purpose with us. So this was a, this was a big thing for us, being a IT people, a big kind of moment. There was less friction in the team because they understood that everybody was different. They understood that they learned differently. They would have different opinions and they would express things differently because of the way they took in information, the way they saw things. Again, we had an understanding about the Myers-Briggs types, which was revolutionary to people in IT. But also it was interesting because I ran what I called an AA session where they all stood up and you know, I am an ESFJ and I am a, which was great because we talked about their grip behaviours. So don't get, you know, think about it. When someone's getting grating on you, is there something else that's going on? Is it because there's something going on with that person? It might not actually be you causing that issue. It might be something with them that you need to take into account. And maybe you just need to bear that in mind and take it offline rather than blowing up and disturbing everybody else in the team. So there's a lot of more understanding created, which was a great thing because it makes the journey a lot easier. So that was a big learning for all of us. And the pace of change, because they started regulating each other 
and filling in for each other's weaknesses and obviously developing via each other's strengths, we found that they self-regulated a lot more. They trained each other a lot more, they buddied and they mentored each other. We set up a system and obviously we, we, we assigned people, but it was up to them to make it work, not up to us. And they did that because they wanted to make the whole better. We have individual targets, but they also wanted to make the team better as a whole. And the interesting thing for us was they came up with a team motto, which we asked them to do, which is no one dies or get left, gets left behind, which sounds a bit extreme, but it does feel a bit extreme sometimes when you're, you're dealing with these big global customers and their expectations are so high and what we have, the value we have to produce is so high. So it does sound an extreme motto and we do laugh about it, but in the bad times that actually keeps us going as a co cohesive unit. And I think you can see a, a motto like that is for a unit, not just about an individual. So I just got one or two um, things we'll move through more quickly really in terms of what we actually did. Um, so just quickly in terms of the, the, the roles and targets aspect, we use something that we call a performance profile and it's a very visual way of, of establishing a role very quickly. And we, we did it because it enables people to get over the thing about roles and objectives which is probably classic that they're used to, but also to step back as a business function look at overlaps and gaps. So it's a sort of personal and, a, and an objective tool. And it meant that the skills they were acquiring were based on, on role profiles, good role profiles. In a, a webinar we ran before Christmas, we asked the audience live, does lack of clarity of role within your organization create problems? And 64% of people said yes. So it's, it's something that sometimes gets ignored in, in change, but actually it's really, really important. How does the new role affect the role that I thought I had before and what's expected of me? So what we did actually with the solution support team was to run a talent optimization workshop and the output was a, a, clarity, a clear definition of roles and responsibilities which then built into a career framework and career path and we made sure that goals and targets were aligned not only in the individual role but also to the departmental overall goals and, and then fundamentally to the SAP overall goals. So on the right hand side you have a, an individual role with a, one area of responsibility which then linked to the map of solution support department's responsibilities for proactive customer advice and we're then able to link that directly to a key strategic business goal of SAP which delivering superior customer value. We're then also able to design a, a targeted assessment center around the scenarios, simulating scenarios for one, one of the key roles that um, we wanted to recruit for to help um, Paul and Victoria. So that meant that they could actually make sure they're recruiting the right people with the right skills. So for that, us, this was very important for the clarity point of view for the team. But also what, we, what was equally important was actually we involved the team in making the role profiles. So they owned it, they were empowered via this because they sat down with learning partners and the management team and we created these role structures. We looked at what behaviours, so they were very clear about that, what was the objective, how we were going to measure it. They inputted into it and they owned it. We've obviously grown, so we've got more roles now. So we've used this process again, and again this reinforces taking people on the change journey, but also makes very clear what everybody needs to do, plus the empowerment part because they actually own it. It's a living, breathing document that gets changed and updated. We all raised bars in our performance every year. Do we, we need to review the roles? Are those behaviours correct? Are the measures correct? Or are they out of date now? Because we learn how to do this via learning partners, we do it ourselves. Occasionally we get them into sanity check it to make sure we're not going off the rails, along with our HR department, of course. Um, but I think the big strength for us was that we involve the people in the process. They understand the process and they live and breathe it too. The only issue we did have is actually they were making and putting the goals a little bit too high. Um, so we needed to make sure that they were being realistic. And it's always good to have a challenge, but that, you know, you've got to make it obtainable. So just, just very quickly in the last sort of couple, couple of minutes, um, the final thing that I uh, just wanted to introduce you to was the feedback cycle that, that we, as uh, Victoria said, that they started to use. And again, this was very much drawing on the ideas and, uh, of neuroscience because the language is very important. So the, what, could, what did you do? Well, as a sort of starting point, and that building confidence and, and 
sort of faith in the fact that, that people could learn from their successes. Very important message. So however difficult and stressful uh, the environment and solution supports became, and it did, you know, it had its moments, people were actually looking for, well, okay, what do we do well here? And then the balance in, in the what could you do differently was, was those were the areas that people would actually quite willingly volunteer and say. Um, so this was used in, in many different ways. So finally then, we made sure that um, in all the reviews that the, the, the use the feedback model in order to reinforce the success of change, conducted some skills training with different people in the team. We took them through a, a talent development and development planning workshop so that they were then able to write their own development objectives that were sensible and use our toolkit to give them some ideas of development actions they could actually put into their development plan on the job, uh, which reinforced all the models, tools and techniques. So for me, this has always been a bit of a contentious issue when I talk to the team about setting their own individual objectives and their development plans. When I spoke to them, do you actually understand what we want and what we require from this process that, you know, we, we want to make it measurable, achievable, etc.? They didn't know where to start. Um, nobody had ever taught them. So what we did was we ran a workshop because I always used to get asked the questions of, can't you do it for me? Can you help me do this? And uh, my response was quite blatant, probably a wrong H1 I want to say, which was, yeah, I'll do that for you, but I'll take 20% of your future earnings if you get a pay increase or... A promotion. So we needed to allow them to do it for themselves in a consistent way, a consistent way that everybody understood and they could keep repeating year in, year out. And this was very powerful for us because they then own their own development, which is a very difficult thing to get people to do. They always think it's their manager's responsibility, or they seem to in our company, it might not be so in yours. So for us, it was something again that we could repeat once we'd learnt it, that we could keep using as a tool and as a model, that everybody knew, and when new people came on, we could reuse it as well. And that people then knew not only what their role was, because we decided that that all together and created these role profiles, how to write their development objectives, but also what their career track was and how they could get there. So what we've got actually is quite, well, not quite, I underestimate that. We've got a very high performing team. We've got a very high performing team that knows where it's going and where they want to go. Okay, not everybody wants to go to the top level, okay? So what do they want to do? How can we develop them? What other things can we look at with them to keep them interested and challenged and not stagnated? and move this unit on together at the speed that we need to do to achieve the results that we're setting. So for us, it's been very important, all these things. They're not individual, they're all interconnected. People, even though we're an IT company, are our business, whether that's the customers or our team. We have to have the right people at the right time to give the right results. And we've learned through this process that ha that has been the reason for our substantial growth. Thank you very much. Thank you.